further ado, the camera is on. Take it away, Ken. I am uh, substituting for Dale Parton tonight and going to introduce our keynote speaker tonight. Um, and I'm going to uh, read uh, Dale's remark, remarks first, and then I've got a couple of side remarks I'd like to say. Tonight, Dale, Dale, Dave Bailey has graciously agreed to give a presentation with very little notice. Dale is well known in this organization for giving challenging and sometimes perplexing presentations with some physics content. This is a major activity <laughs> of his, so I might even wonder if it borders on an addiction. Uh, Dave says that he had he was in astronomy in astronomy before he was born, as his parents met his graduate students at the Yerkes Observatory in the 1930s. Oh, it, it, he also studied under Carl Sagan, another leading astronomer at Hawk. His, top, his, uh, his topic tonight is entitled, How Neutron Stars Form. One of the nice things about David is he is probably, I would say, in the top 1% of the knowledgeable people in this club. And um, he always tells people that uh, he will answer any question you have about astronomy, not hearing it not guaranteed to be correct. All right. And uh, without further ado, uh, my dear friend. One, one addendum. Dave found out at like 5 or 6 p.m. yesterday that he was giving this presentation. So we appreciate that. Well, Give him a round of applause for that. That was great. I knew I was giving the presentation, but I thought it was going to be February. <laughs> Um, also, uh, we came very close to having an actual um, um, audiovisual problem. And I always used to, to joke about the people who had problems getting, getting going by saying, it's never taken me more than five minutes to get the cap off my dry erase marker. But this time, uh, well, I've used up two of them already and I've put that much on the board. Um, Okay, um, let's start out with uh, Kelvin and Helmholtz. Who knows about Kelvin and Helmholtz? Kelvin. Okay, yeah, yeah, Kelvin a couple of people. Yeah, okay, <laughs> trivia question. Probably Ken can answer. I'm not going to do it. What was the biggest problem Kelvin and Helmholtz had collaborating on the work they did on the, the, how long the sun could last? Go ahead, Jim, do it. They didn't know the mechanism for why which gener the energy was being generated. No, they had a more fundamental problem collaborating. Oh. Each one was totally unaware that the other one was doing the calculation. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's what I remember. Simultaneously, within a couple of years. Yeah, and that's um, virtually simultaneous too. What Kelvin and Helmholtz wanted to know is, okay, we know that the sun isn't made out of coal because it would not last long. It would last a few thousand years at most, and that would go out. Um, suppose the sun was heaved up by contracting from a very large object down to the size of the sun. How long could it burn then, quote burn, at its present luminosity? And the answer was that formation of the sun liberates a certain amount of energy, and that energy is 25 million sun years worth of energy. So the sun could shine for 25 million years on the energy it got from contracting down to that side. Gravity pulls it in. That low rates energy. Okay, well, that uh, didn't work very well because the geologists and the paleontologists both were saying, the Earth has got to be long, older, way older than 25 million years. How can the Earth be older than the Sun? And then they discovered, well, hydrogen fusion in the center of the Sun, and this. Sun spends a certain amount of time as a main sequence star, which is basically the way it is now, and that can liberate this much of energy by fusing hydrogen, 8,000 million sun years of energy. Yeah. Dave, I, I re seem to recall that there was a big uh, schism in, in science at that time between was, the, the archaeologists yeah. who knew that these fossils from the dinosaurs were much older than the age of the Earth that yeah. could be at that time. Yep, yep. And um, I like 8,000 million better than, than 10,000 million, by the way. Uh, no. A lot of the popular books are still saying 10,000 million, but I'm right, they're wrong. And the, the other astrophysicists are starting to come in line as well uh, with me. 
Um, okay, so now we understand how the sun could could stay luminous for that long by burning uh, hydrogen, using hydrogen. And that's basically the collapse of a, of, of a star-like object. It started out really big and it collapsed until it got the size it is now. Suppose we uh, collapse something to form a white dwarf star. Well, that's a lot smaller and the, the mass of white dwarf is typically 60% as massive as the sun. Um, and if you collapse it something smaller, then the gravity has that much more space to work. And um, the, what you get out of it basically is proportional to 1 over r, the radius. And so making a white dwarf liberates enough energy to keep the sun shining for 900 million sun years. That's still not enough. It's less energy than, than the sun gets from hydrogen. Suppose we collapse something to form a neutron star. Well, a neutron star is really tiny. White dwarf is the size of the Earth. It's about 100 times smaller than the sun. A neutron star is so tiny, you get that much. Notice, two and a half million. But there's another million tacked on. That's a lot of sun years worth of, <laughs> of, of energy. And. What can we learn from that? Well, we can learn that the gravitational potential well of a neutron star is really, really deep. We can learn from that also. Uh, I'm not going to even go through the, the math because it's obvious when comparing that number and that number. If you take some stuff and you contract it down to the size of a neutron star, and that, then it turns out that it's um, nuclear fuel, you can fuse it. Fuse it from hydrogen to iron. What happens? Well, here's your neutron star. You wave your magic wand, you convert it into hydrogen, now say, fuse hydrogen into iron. What happens? It goes, boom, and it falls back. It just barely expands it a tiny bit. Once you've got a neutron star formed, it stays formed. The only way you can change is by dumping more material on it, and eventually it collapses into a black hole. But Basically, a neutron star is forever. Um, so how do those things form? Well, once they form, they pull themselves together a huge amount. Um, but in the early stages of the formation, it may be hard. And it's hard. Uh, a lot of stars that try to form a neutron star, they fail. What do they do instead? They explode as a supernova. Wait a minute. <laughs> That must be pretty hard. Uh, and then a lot of stars also that are trying to become a supernova, they fail at that. What happens to them? They collapse into a, into a neutron star. And it's almost a, almost a choice the star has. OK, I'm in an energy crisis. What's going to happen? I'm starting to collapse, maybe. But a lot of nuclear fusion has started to pick up in the core. What's going to happen? Am I going to go like that? Or am I going to go like that? And it turns out that there's a number of factors that determine which is going to happen. Um, suppose we had a white dwarf star. How many people know what a white dwarf star is, more or less? <laughs> a few. Yeah, OK. Um, oh, and a um, general question, a uh, general thing to say. Um, I like questions in real time. The reason why is if you say I'll ask the question at the end, you forget what you wanted to ask. So yeah, I love the question. If it's something that I think only you and me are interested in, I'll say, let's talk about it later. If there's two or three other people that I think might be interested, then I'll answer the question in real time. Yeah? Dave, what's a white door? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Um, basically, it's a star that appears the sun, and uh, it's a star that's about this big, as compared to the sun. It's about the size of the Earth, and it doesn't, it's not made out of atoms. All the electrons have been stripped off of the atoms. And it's supported against further collapse by a thing called electron degeneracy pressure, which I'm not going to talk about now. Um, 
they're enough different from ordinary stars that some people, including myself, are a little bit reluctant to even call them stars. They're very interesting objects, but are they stars? One might ask the same of neutron stars. Indeed. In fact, you ask the question even more about neutron stars. Um, suppose we wanted to uh, collapse this thing further and collapse it down until it's this big. Now, if you can't see that mark on the board, well, you shouldn't because I didn't actually touch the board. It's that small. Um, and uh, it's um, a typical neutron star is about the size of Detroit or Chicago. And um, you're turned off, aren't you? I'm, I'm on now. You're turned off. No, I, it's running. Anyway. It um, takes a while to warm up. Yeah, it takes a while to warm up. Uh, neutron star radius is typically 12 kilometers, something like that. And nobody knows exactly how big they are. Um, and, uh, but we know they're very small. Um, basically, a neutron star is a very large there atomic nucleus. There you go. Yeah, there is. There's Chicago. And um, most neutron stars have an outer <coughs> crust, and this is not shown to scale. I mean, on this on this scale, the outer crust might be um, 50 yards or 100 yards or something. I mean, the crust is really, really, really thin. Uh, there's multiple crusts made of different materials, and nobody's sure what the crusts are made out of either. Um, nobody's ever been up, up close to a neutron star and uh, lived to tell the tale. Yeah? Hey, what are neutron stars made out of? Ah, hey, nobody's entirely sure. Um, you might think <coughs> they're made out of neutrons. Um, but um, some neutron stars are actually only about 87% neutrons by, by, by weight, and the other part is protons. Yeah? If the neutron stars are made out of, uh, out of uh, atomic particles rather than atomic nuclei, yeah. then how could they be made out of any material, any identifiable thing that we identify as material? Well, they're, 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 made made out of out, they're made out of the same stuff that atomic nuclei are made out of. In other words, the car a carbon atom right. in your body right. 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 has a nuclease. Right. What's in there? Nuclear material. Nuclear so material. just imagine, instead of that tiny thing, which is 10,000 times smaller than an atom right. in one of your carbon atoms, imagine something that's the size of this township. But it's the same stuff. But, but, but are the... So they're made of nuclear are material. The, are the uh, nuclear, nuclear materials associated with matter... <laughs> That that uh, that elements are made of. Elements are irre irrelevant. That's what I mean. That, so yeah. it's irrelevant. You can't say that the crust is made. Can't out say of it's made out of iron, helium, no, or no, 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 no. Well, the crust you can. The crust, the outer crust. Oh. But it might be that the crust you're talking about might only be that thick. They have really thin crust. Suppose we wanted to collapse. Oh, there's a, an example. Yeah. There's a white dwarf about the size of the Earth. Uh, the sun is about 100 times bigger than either of those. It's a neutron star. Actually, that speck's a bit too big. Yeah. What's the white dwarf made of? You never got to. Um, most white dwarfs are made of carbon and oxygen. Um, nuclei, yes. And most of the electrons are stripped off. But at least. You can't identify the electrons aren't anywhere to be found in the white board. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're there. That's that's what holds the holds it up and prevents it from collapsing further. It's those electrons. And what about in the neutron star? Are those electrons there? Uh, there are some, but not enough to hold it up. They're held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. When you squeeze neutrons together, after a while they start to resist your squeezing, and um, it's sort of like um, squeeze a billiard ball. What happens? Nothing happens. I'm squeezing. Nothing happens. And uh, most stars are supported by thermal pressure. But you know a billiard ball isn't supported by thermal pressure because you put one in the freezer, it should be easier to squeeze. No, it's just as hard to squeeze if it's in the freezer as if it's at room temperature. And that's uh, how electron degeneracy works. And that's how neutron degeneracy works. And the question I was asking was, suppose, suppose we wanted to encourage this thing to collapse 
into a, into a uh, neutron star. What would happen if you started to collapse a white dwarf? Well, the materials in the white dwarf would start to fuse more, nuclear fusion, and they might produce enough energy that the thing would explode as a type 1a supernova. Um, and the question is, how much fuel energy do you get out of the materials that white dwarfs can be made out of? Almost all white dwarfs are made of these two, carbon and oxygen, carbon 12, oxygen 16 are the common uh, types of nuclei of carbon and oxygen. There are some helium white dwarfs. We don't know too much about them because they're kind of rare. So the nearest ones aren't that close by. Um, we know that some are made out of oxygen, neon, and magnesium. Um, and we assume that some are made out of silicon group elements, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, argon. So if we were hoping, crossing our fingers and hoping, that this white dwarf is going to collapse into a neutron star, and we're saying, well, yeah, but there's all this nuclear energy being released in fusion reactions because it gets awfully hot when it starts to collapse. How bad is that situation? Well, helium-4 gives you that much fuel per, per baryon. This is MeV per baryon. Hey, what's a baryon? Which will mean something to, to <laughs> some of you, per baryon. Hey, what's an electron? A baryon is a proton or a neutron. And um, protons and neutrons are what you find in the nucleus of an atom. Um, so that amount of energy you get from use, fusing helium-4 into iron group elements, like nickel-56. Uh, if you're fusing carbon, you get that much energy, oxygen, that much, neon, magnesium, silicon. Silicon <coughs> is not a very good uh, fusion fuel because you only get 0.195 MeV per baryon versus like almost 10 times more for helium. Um, so you, you say, well, if we're going to collapse a white dwarf star and make a neutron star, we might want to start with one that's made out of this stuff down here. The problem is there are hardly any white dwarfs that are made out of that kind of stuff. There's quite a few that are made out of oxygen, neon, and magnesium. Does that have to do with the, 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 the start of the star? I mean, the earlier stages of the star, what is there? Stars that are more massive, they do more kinds of fusion before they start to run out of fuel. And um, the, the core of the star is going to end up being a white dwarf star. Much more likely to be a white dwarf star of this type. that's made out of those things rather than carbon and oxygen. Um, so that's one of the factors that determines how likely it is that a white dwarf star will collapse into a neutron star. And there's other factors. And Dave, how many neutron stars have been cataloged? Um, I think it's dozens. I don't know about hundreds. When you catalog something, you'd like to have something to say about it. And if about, about all you can say is, well, there was a supernova in M81, and maybe it formed a neutron star. There's no evidence of it, but maybe. I wouldn't catalog that. Yeah. Actually, there are about 2,000 known in the Milky Way and Magellanic yeah. Cloud. Cool. cool. <coughs> I guess they have low, low standards for what, what, <laughs> what should be cataloged. Um, factors which favor collapse. Heavier nuclei. These are heavier. A neon nucleus has 20 baryons in it. An oxygen nucleus has 16 baryons, as opposed to 4 for helium, 12 for and so on. Um, hey, they're heavier. If you're trying to make something collapse from gravity, it might be a good idea to start with heavy stuff. Um, higher mass white dwarf. 
Yeah. If you're trying to make the thing collapse in on itself, if it's got more stuff in it, then that's probably a good idea. Um, and these, the ones further down on the list, are more massive by course. Um, paradoxically, they're also smaller. If this is a typical white dwarf made out of carbon and oxygen, one made out of silicon is going to be like that big, and it's going to be more massive. Um, the smallest that a white dwarf can get without collapsing into a neutron star is about the size of the moon. So we have one of these um, smaller than the moon things. Uh, a white dwarf is not allowed to get smaller than the moon, and if it does, it collapses. What's causing all this collapsing? Gravity. Sorry to give you a simple answer. Well, I'd give you a complicated one if I, I could. I, I, I know, but nobody understands what the heck gravity is. This is true. But we understand very much how gravity works. Works, right. And the um, problem, though, is that um, uh, the person who knew the most about it uh, died in 1955, right? That would have been Albert. Although there are people now that probably know it as Kip Thorne and a few other people know more, arguably more than Einstein ever did. But they did so by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so everything really in this universe works around gravity. Um, yeah. That, that's what's driving this <laughs> number here. Here's what, here's what nuclear fusion can do. Here's what gravity can do. Um, that's not really fair to, to nuclear fusion. I shouldn't, I shouldn't criticize nuclear fusion. <laughs> nuclear fusion is young. Yeah, yes. Um, okay, what else? Um, well, one of the things that happens when you start to collapse a, a white dwarf is that nuclear fusion starts up. And it'll start up in a particular part of the star. And like if here is here is a white dwarf star, and if the fusion starts out, uh, let's say it starts out right here. And the reason why is a lot of these stars are actually considerably cooler in the center than they are at the outer edge. Um, maybe I shouldn't put it right there, but maybe there. So fusion starts there, and the flame starts coming out. I call it flame, but really it's not like, well, like a forest fire flame, but it's, it is like a forest fire in the sense the flame spreads out slower than the speed of sound. And if the flame spreads faster than about 4% of the speed of sound, this thing will probably turn into a supernova. If the flame spreads slower than 4% of the speed of sound, it may well collapse into a neutron star. Yeah, I think you implicitly have said that a white dwarf has no fusion going on. No. Young white dwarfs do. They're still burning a little bit of helium, leftover helium. Um, but that doesn't last long. So the white dwarf is inactive. Uh, it's inactive fusion. What is it? What is it getting its? Um, what is it getting its its energy from? It's it's radiating uh, light out from the from the surface. A lot of light is going out from the surface. Where's that coming from? Well, basically, it's just cooling off. It's cooling off. That's all. It's getting cooler. A new white dwarf is about 80, 80 million degrees Kelvin in the center. And out here at the edge, it may be one hundred and ninety million. Multiply times one point eight, um, and uh, that that relates to things called um, neutrino cooling. Um, we, if we have time, we'll talk about neutrino cooling. Um, okay, other factors: slower burning and, and encourages collapse. Less than four percent of the speed of sound. Now I'm talking about I'm not talking about the speed of sound in Earth air. I'm talking about the speed of sound in that material, which is extremely hot, extremely dense, extremely stiff, and uh, the speed of sound in that material is at least a thousand times faster than the speed of sound in air. I don't 
I don't have the numbers right in front of me, a cooler core. If this core, instead of being 80 million degrees Kelvin, if it's like 5 million, and out here at the surface it's going to be like 60,000 60, degrees Kelvin. That's way cooler. That's an old white dwarf now. Um, it stands to reason. If you're trying to make something collapse, it's really hot. It might be hard to make it collapse. Um, another one is a solid core. A lot of white dwarfs actually are solid inside. The material in there is not like anything that we are accustomed to. Um, but it's uh, about to be a crystal. And if it is a crystal, then if it starts to collapse and energy is starting is going to get hot, uh, then it will take a lot of energy to melt that thing, and then it will take a lot of energy to boil it. And we're talking about this thing in the center is like, let's say it's 5 million degrees Kelvin. And it's solid? Yeah, it's solid. Um, this stuff is not normal matter, and so it doesn't melt and boil at the temperatures you might think. Yeah? I, I was just wondering if you could talk about how that relates to the claim that announces the start of a supernova. What starts a supernova? There's a, basically in a type 2 supernova, there's a, a claim, like a bell, that oh. uh -huh. in, in the models. So. Well, well, what's happening is that uh, there's a major collapse occurring and everything um, crashes together at the center and uh, it, um, the more you know about that kind of thing, the less likely you're going to talk about it because if you talk about it to intelligent people, you're telling them how to make an atomic bomb, basically. <laughs> and um, I don't know enough to be dangerous in that regard, but. Basically, if you smash a lot of stuff together in a spherical way, that's made of plutonium, it will explode as an atomic bomb when the, all the stuff hits at the center. So yeah, it's the same stuff, same kind of thing happening. Um, other factors. Um, oh, faster accretion rate. A typical. What have you got here? Oh, this shows uh, electron degeneracy. Uh, we can talk about that more later, but uh, it's not really directly related to, to neutron stars because um, it's basically a white dwarf thing. Uh, but white dwarfs, at least uh, in modern times, over the past like 25 years, people have been taking white dwarfs more and more seriously as precursors to neutron stars. It used to be people thought, oh yeah, neutron stars, those are made from core collapse supernovas. And a lot of them still are. But it's become more and more fashionable for white dwarfs to collapse to form neutron stars. Um, so, yeah, um, how do you make a white dwarf collapse? Well, you can make it collapse by having a nearby star dump material on top of it, and that makes it heavier and heavier, and eventually it can't support itself anymore by gravity. Um, here would be a, a companion star, and over here would be a white dwarf, and material from the companion star gradually leaks off, and puts one like this, and this is orbiting around, there's orbital motion there. The center of mass of this thing is about here. The white dwarf is the heavy one. That one goes out goes like that. And material comes out here, and it uh, it falls. It doesn't fall straight towards the center of mass or towards the neutron star. It falls over this way. Why? Is because of the Coriolis effect. And uh, it falls and it falls and it falls, and then it hits the material that's orbiting the. Yeah orbiting the, the white dwarf. Yeah, there's this big ring structure here, stuff that's orbiting. When it hits there, it makes a humongous splash. This is usually the brightest part of the system. 
And then this trails off here. This is also very, very dark. And this maturity is gradually spiraling inwards. Um, those are interesting stars. They're fun to draw pictures of. It's too bad nobody's ever had an actual picture of one. Um, Hubble, forget it. <laughs> forget it. Because you remember, this thing is the size of the Earth. And that thing is the size of a modest star. That would be like a red dwarf star at this scale. <coughs> this stuff is this is called accretion. This is called this is called an accretion disk. This material is gradually spiraling inwards. And so the, the accretion rate is quoted in how long it would take for one solar mass of material to fall onto that neutron star. Would it take a billion years? Then that's 10 to the minus 9 solar masses per year. That's a rather slow rate of accretion. 10 to the minus 6 is a lot faster. Um, the faster the accretion rate, it turns out, tends to favor collapse. And at first you thought, well, why is that? And the reason is that if we blow this up, so that you can see the, the white dwarfs, the material is falling onto the surface of the white dwarfs, it's spiraling inwards, and it's heating up the equator of the white dwarfs. And that heated energy gradually soaks into the star. And the center is getting hotter, and the hotter the center gets, the harder it's going to be to have the thing collapse. So faster accretion rates favor collapse. Um, there's, there's a chart here that shows what some Japanese astrophysicists think happens to, to white dwarfs. And uh, across here is the mass of the, of the white dwarf from 0.8 times the mass of the sun up to 1.4 times the mass of the sun. Here's the accretion rate from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 4. And there's areas in here where the Japanese astrophysicists say neutron stars will form. And there's areas here that say that supernovas will happen. And the fact that this is a complicated diagram shows that it's probably the Japanese think it's complicated, maybe it is. Um, the Americans, uh, one of them's uh, from, uh, one's from California, the other one's, I forget where, I think both from California. They draw a similar diagram. Um, <coughs> so, there's other ways of making supernovas. Now, there's other ways of making neutron stars. Um, one of the ways of making a neutron star is just you, instead of starting with this big star, like a white dwarf star, I mean, excuse me, like a red dwarf star, and a, a white dwarf star, um, start with two white dwarf stars, have them spiral inwards towards each other, which they can do by emitting gravitational wave radiation. Um, on this scale, uh, instead of the thing being like there, and the other star being there, one star would be here, and the other one would be here. And they'd be spiraling around each other, would you believe, in probably 30 seconds? Two stars that orbit each other every 30 seconds? That's fast. Well, they're really close together. And if they're orbiting that fast, and if they're massive, they weigh about as much as the sun, maybe a bit less. Gravitational waves are going outwards. I'll draw some rings, like, like ripples in a pool. And that energy is being removed by gravitational waves. Um, and that's... What's gravitational waves? Yeah. <laughs> gravitational well, waves crazy. are distortions in space. And the way you make a gravitational wave detector, believe it or not, you have two spacecraft here with lasers. And they've got laser beams going across from one to the other and back. They're measuring the distance between the two spacecraft 
very accurately all the time. And if that distance between the two spacecraft suddenly starts going like this, oh, that's a gravitational wave. What's happening? The space between them is getting shaken. That's gravitational wave. Maybe. Maybe. Nobody's detected one, but we are absolutely sure that they happen because Einstein said so. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so that's a second way of making a neutron star is these two white dwarfs are spiraling closer and closer together. When they get too close, they fuse into one. They discover that they are too heavy to be a white dwarf star. White dwarf stars can't exist heavier than about 1.3 times the mass of the sun. They used to say 1.44, that was Chandrasekhar's limit, but there's a lot, that's a lot of approximations in that 1.44 number, and uh, 1.3 is more like it. Um, so we got two ways of making, um, making a neutron star. One is by dumping material onto a white dwarf until it gets to be over about 1.3 times the mass of the sun. The other is by spiraling two white dwarfs together. You can get it to be way in, in excess of 1.3 by doing that. Suppose each one weighs 1.2. <laughs> then when they merge, they're at 2.4. If they make something that looks like a supernova type 1A, because they will, look sort of like that because they're, made, they're white dwarfs and they're exploding. You may think that's a supernova 1A explosion, but really it's twice as energetic as a supernova 1A. And supernova 1As are used by cosmologists as standard candles. You see one go off in a distant galaxy and you say, oh, I know that's a supernova 1A because the spectrum is right and the uh, light curve in terms of time is right. And so that's a supernova 1A. I, I know how bright it looks. I know how bright it really is because I know what supernova 1As are. I know how far away that galaxy is. There's all kinds of problems. One is, there's a cloud of dust in front of that supernova 1A in that distant galaxy. It's really brighter than it looks because the light went through a bunch of dust before it even got here. And there's ways so that you can try to get around that. But <coughs> um, if supernova 1As really vary a lot more than, than people think, then our distance measurements of galaxies is all in error. Okay. Um, third way of making a uh, supernova, which then, well, you make a supernova, but you also make a, a neutron star at the same time. Um, third way of making a supernova, uh, like a neutron star. Um, it's called the core collapse. And um, in that case, you have a big star, um, a supergiant star. And uh, in the center of the supergiant star is a thing that looks like a white dwarf, but it's made of different stuff. There's a lot of iron in it. And uh, iron is on the list here with white dwarf materials. Uh, I don't think anybody has seen a clear case of a white dwarf that was made out of iron materials. Um, anyway, what, how big is a supergiant star? Well. A big one is about the size of the inner solar system, maybe um, maybe the solar system up to Jupiter's orbit. That's a big thing. Hmm. Um, like if here's the sun and here's the Earth's orbit, then the supergiant star is this big. Wow. So what's on the center of it? Well, the center of it is this object which is not not much bigger than, than the regular white dwarf. It might be two or three times bigger than a white dwarf. So here's the Earth, here's a white dwarf. This core, pre-supernova core, which is gonna become a neutron star, might be that big. That's teeny tiny compared to this, when you consider the, the Earth would be a speck too small to see on the scale, and it's going around with something like that. Um, A 
I was going to have a whole bunch more stuff on the board, but um, I don't have time to mark it down with the markers. Um, I should probably talk a little bit more about what supernova, about what um, neutron stars are really like. Um, a lot of interesting chemistry takes, quasi chemistry takes place during the collapse. Um, one of the things that's interesting that happens is that you can end up with bubbles in nuclear material. What's at the center of a, of an, a regular atom is um, an atom, say, the size of this room. There's a nucleus that's about that big and it's made out of nuclear material. In some of these neutron stars, there are little bubbles that are that big, which is places where there is not nuclear material, which is sort of interesting. Um, did you have your hand up, Jonathan? Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about what, what prevents it, a black hole from forming. What what causes the collapse to stop sure. at a neutron star and not continue on to a black hole? Sure. Um, well, it's called the uh, neutron degeneracy pressure. And um, it's similar to electron degeneracy <coughs> pressure, except that um, the stable things that form are about 600 times smaller. A typical neutron star is 600 times smaller than a typical white dwarf star. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens inside the uh, neutron star? Oh, here's, um, here's a good picture of, uh, of a close uh, double star. Yeah. That falling material is a little too much of a straight line. That's coming off, and well, anyway, it's not bad as a, as a uh, arc suppression goes. Um, people speculate that in the course of some neutron stars, there's exotic material. Um, things like pions, pion metals, <coughs> other things like that. I don't think we know enough about the details of neutron stars to be sure what's in the core. Maybe just basically neutrons. And, and a few protons and electrons. You do know one thing for sure, the number of protons and the number of electrons is likely to be the same because the material is electrically neutral. Hmm. Um, there is a possibility of some other negatively charged objects in there, like negative pions, also negative muons. Um, those are both very unstable uh, under normal conditions, but the center of a neutron star, they're both likely to be stable. Um, if, if you have electron um, degeneracy that's extreme enough, um, a negative muon becomes a stable particle. But anyway, um, how are we doing on time? We've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay. If, you, if you want it. Um, maybe I should clear away the board and uh, have Ken put up some more um, pictures. Um, and you can um, kill most of the uh, most of the light. Okay. Yeah. Uh, suppose that gravity waves do not exist despite Einstein creating them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there another mechanism that would allow uh, the two white dwarf stars to come together, or is that um, good evidence for gravity waves in itself? Well, we have seen close uh, binary stars gradually spiraling inwards, which we can determine um, by just by timing their, their, their orbits. And the rate of spiral agrees with general relativity's predictions. Through gravity wave radiation? Yeah. In other words, we can't detect the gravity waves yet because we don't have good enough lasers in space. You want like two lasers a million miles apart looking at each other and counting the, counting the waves. I mean, there's 
thousands of waves in a millimeter, and you want to count them over, you know, many, many miles. Make sure that you don't lose count. And uh, if you can do that, you can detect gravity waves. Uh, yeah. But you can see the energy that's being removed from these two stars that are orbiting each other because they're orbiting faster and faster. That means they're getting closer and closer together. That means they're losing energy. And the best uh, theory about the, they're losing energy is the gravity waves. Why? Because general relativity predicts that they should be losing energy at that rate. In other words, the numbers match. What have we got here? got a neutron star. Uh, I'm not sure what that's supposed to represent. Um, I want to erase more of this stuff because the, that is not really in the You could actually bring down the screen and that will take care of all uh, that. Take care of that, yeah. Oh, I kind of wrapped it. That's okay. That was the sound that it... This is taking a parameter count. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, I'm not particularly interested in that. I could explain it, but take too long. Um, there's two neutron stars joining. Um, but this is so bright here. If, if those were actually as bright as real neutron stars, um, people getting sunburned in downtown Detroit. Oh. This is bright stuff we're talking about. Um, eh, eh, eh. Okay, there's a supernova remnant um, in the center there somewhere. It might be that one, it might be that one. That one is blue, so that might be the neutron star um, in the center of that uh, cloud. Um, is that uh, Cassiopeia? Mm -hmm. What does the caption say? Caption says... I think it's W50 uh, or something like that. Doesn't actually give it to me. Well, anyway, go on. That's false color, by the way. Of course. Um, all right, there's a neutron star, which is emitting two beams of energy uh, from its poles. Um, probably it's magnetic poles. It may be spinning um, rapidly. Um, mm. That is a white dwarf. That's all. Uh, a, a star about to become a white dwarf. This is the um, Eskimo Nebula. That's the Eskimo Nebula. And I have an idea about that one. You see all these things that look like comets? Mm. I'm wondering if that is an Oort cloud worth of comets surrounding that star. Hmm. Getting melted. Yeah, yeah, hmm. yeah. Now, I don't know what the scale of that picture is, but anyway, uh, that's a jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at it. <laughs> um, neutron star. Yeah, this one is also emitting, um, emitting two, two beams of high energy stuff. And there, I don't know what that thing is. So, so the, the, yes. the, so the Eskimo Nebula there yes. has a planetary nebula. And yes. the, the neutron star was a remnant after. No, it, 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 it will become, it will be a white dwarf. So. And, uh, <coughs> uh, that's an interesting thing. I have never seen the word neutron star associated with that object. Uh, but it's interesting. Um, what this is is a light echo. Uh -huh. This star produced a pretty bright flash of light, which probably lasted for, what, a week or two? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this, this shell of light is moving outwards, and it's encountering stuff, clouds in, the, in, in, in space. And you can see the clouds are not uniform. And in particular, there's two holes in the clouds, there and there. And, and there's another one. And um, so that's a light echo from uh, from a V737 in Monteceros. Well, it says down yeah, there in the caption yeah. that the red supergiant replaced its core with a neutron star. Yeah, I have not seen that explanation. Yeah. Um, oh. And so uh, it's a new a new concept for me. I'll have to think about that whether I agree or disagree. So Dave, can, can we go back two slides? Two. That's a yes no. No, back oh. back right. The so, uh, no, not that one. Either side of that, actually. So, isn't that red? Okay, Which stop on, is? stop on, stop, stop there. there. Okay, isn't that color a little bit strange? Would the would the crust of a neutron star be that cool? Um, 
Well, the, the whole thing is, is, is uh, artificial color. It's false color anyway. You can use any colors you like. Well, yeah. I've seen pictures of the sun showing the, the core of the sun as black. And the, the reasoning was that most of the energy down there is in the form of x-rays. Your eyes can't see x-rays, so it must be yeah. black down there. No. No. The, the core of the sun is the brightest part of the sun. But anyway. It, so you can use whatever colors you like when you make one of those artist conceptions. So if these things are so rare and so bizarre, how do we even know that they have crusts? How did they determine that? How they have crusts? Yes. Oh. Um, well, the atmosphere people will tell you. Okay. And the atmosphere people will give you an idea of how thick they are. Um, uh, the atmosphere of a white dwarf is about a thousand feet thick. Um, why? Because the white dwarf has uh, strong gravitational fields. And uh, any, any stuff that's high up above the white dwarf will get pulled down, basically. And so the whole atmosphere of a white dwarf is about a thousand feet thick. Um, the atmosphere of a uh, Neutron star is probably a couple inches thick because the gravity is so much stronger. And you, you, there's some ideas about how transparent the material is. Um, basically, um, you can look down into a star until you reach the photosphere. You can't see anything below the photosphere because below that point the material is too opaque to see further down. Um, Neutrinos are very penetrating particles, and so if you had a neutrino telescope, you could see down into the neutrino sphere, which um, people talk about when they're talking about uh, explosions of uh, supernovas and such. And uh, if, if you could <coughs> use a neutrino telescope, you could see maybe in as far as maybe 100 miles from the center of the, of the star, where the, where the uh, neutron star is actually in the process of forming, but we don't have good neutrino telescopes. And if you could, you could you couldn't resolve anything down there anyway because it's just a speck in any case. What do we got here? Um, we have some kind of opaque material here. I suppose that's dust. And we have some kind of high velocity stuff coming out here. Um, it may be coming out at 26% uh, of the speed of light. Uh, that's a kind of a magic number. Um, material that comes out from a high energy star quite often could be moving at 26% of the speed of light. Uh, it's not an approximation, it's an exact number. It comes from atomic physics theory. Um, what does the text say for this one? Image of Pluto. It says right up there, so I guess it's it says a neutron star pours its heart out. <laughs> now here again, the, the solid crust is a mile thick. I don't believe in a solid crust on a neutron star. Um, maybe there is a solid crust. I don't know, but I don't automatically believe it. Um, the Earth has a solid crust. It's even that order of magnitude in size. Our, our solid crust is thicker than that. Well, our solid crust on the Earth is like that thick. So it's, the whole the whole neutron star is smaller than the thickness of our solid crust it's on the Earth. The term solid is a relative term. That's right. Yeah, it seems like we're using words to approximate yeah. things that are yeah. So foreign to and this is um, this is a bell yeah. and you can see this is the clapper here and here's the string that you pull on the clapper to pull it on the side of the bell. Um, but actually, that's on the center of uh, M1, uh, which is a supernova remnant. <laughs> Dave, did you talk about what causes a neutron star to turn on as a pulsar or? Oh. Can they switch well, back and forth from being pulsars and being quiet? Well, a lot of neutron stars are pulsars, but their energy is not coming towards the Earth. So we can't, we can't ah. hear it on, and with radio telescopes. Um, if, the, if the neutron star were precessing so that its spin axis was moving around, Mm -hmm. Then we might be able to detect it briefly as a series of pulses, and then it would go silent again. 
and then later on it would come on again. And there are stars that you know, essentially do that. I don't know if there's uh, really good cases of neutron stars that do that, but um, pulsars generally, they, they, um, they get louder and then they get quieter. Sometimes uh, some of the pulses are missing because they're so quiet. And that seems to be because of scintillation in the uh, interstellar medium. Um, the radio waves are coming through through the, through the vacuum. The, <coughs> the space that the radio waves are coming through is not a total vacuum. And, and so um, it's like listening to a, a signal on the short waves. The station comes and goes and fades out and comes in again. What have we got here? International team of yeah, astronomers has made the highest revolution, resolution measurement of a neutron star. That's what it says. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't see that there's any relevance to this picture. All right, we can get away from that. Oh, there's a better image of that. This is the neutron star in the center of the Crab Nebula. And um, we know how fast it spins because we can count the pulses <coughs> as a pulsar. And it spins 33 times per second. Um, and at first you say, wait a minute, something the size of Detroit spins around 30, 33 times every second? But there are neutron stars that spin about 20 times faster than that. <laughs> They're in the minority. But some More massive? Really Yeah, I think we saw that before. Didn't we? White dwarfs vary in size. The more massive ones are only one quarter of the size of Earth. What happened there? I think we got a record. Okay. So what makes them spin? Ah, uh, what makes them spin? Yeah. Basically, material from the uh, from the companion star. I was showing you pictures on the board here of. Yeah. Uh, a companion star of material was falling onto the white dwarf, and the two stars were orbiting around each other, and um, that can make the white dwarf spin faster and faster and faster. And if later on the white dwarf collapses into a neutron star, then it spins really fast, like, you know, maybe a hundred times per second. Um, and uh, that's the usual thing about, yeah, watch the figure skater, and she has her arms out like this, and then she pulls them in, and she spins faster and faster and faster. And, uh, you know, if you're starting out with something the size of the Earth, and then collapse it down to something the size of Detroit, you can imagine that it could really, really spinning very fast. And, uh, okay. Yeah. You know, an analogy would be when you put the fly down on your bathtub, the water starts rotating, and it goes down. As, as as it, the rotation coming down. Yeah, you can't see the rotation when it's far out from the from the drain. But as it gets closer and closer, you can see that yeah, it was rotating, even though you couldn't tell. And now it's rotating faster and faster. All right. Any any final questions? Um, I have an apology for the disorganization of the talk. But I've been known to give disorganized talks when I was prepared, so <laughs> maybe it's not because of the rush. Um, I would have a handout for you of like a dozen pages, which would have a lot of stuff that wasn't even covered in the talk, because usually my handouts are like three to four times more material than I can possibly cover. And so I encourage people to, uh, to read the handouts and ask questions. That was given to him at least.